Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen and to tune in. God bless you all. If you are watching this on video, I apologize for the mess in the background. I am in the middle of moving. So next video will probably be at a new location. So it's going to be a little bit of a change of scenery. But we are going to continue on with Revelations, the great, excuse me, Revelation, the great book of Revelation, consisting of many revelations. And yeah, let's get right into it. So the, the title for this chapter is A Message to the Church in Ephesus, um, and also a message to churches in Smyrna, uh, Pergamum, Thyatira, probably, if I'm saying that right. So it starts off, uh, verse 1, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So first off, that's just saying, hey, this is from Jesus, like Christ wrote this message, or he, he communicated this message to us. Um, understand, too, that the it's interesting, the idea that he walks among the seven lampstands, because remember, the lampstands, they represent the church. They're the spirit of the church. There is the same, the fire that illuminates those lamps is the same fire that burns in the eyes of Jesus as he appeared to John. And so he is, he is interacting with these things. He is animating the life of these churches. The, he is the spirit that is behind the movement. And it's really interesting. We won't get into it today, but the, the history of the church and how it was a couple people, right, that were on fire for Jesus because they experienced him. They experienced his, his miracles and they went out into the world and, and preached this message. And it was a radical shift. It was so many people converted. So many people came to know God through the, the teachings of these people, because they were communicating something that was animated by the spirit. This is not something that people are just doing. It's not just the words of men. It is the spirit of God. He says, I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you won't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered with me, or excuse me, for me, without quitting. So, first of all, I know all the things that you do. God sees everything, right? That that fire that is that is in His eyes, that is the illumination. He is He is in all. He He observes all. And sometimes when people ask, "Well, does God know what's going to happen?" Right? How can there be free will if He just knows what's going to happen? Why would he make somebody that he knows is not going to to to, to follow him? Um, and was the thing is, you've got to get out of this mindset of thinking about it from our perspective, because God is outside of time. He's not confined by time. So he's not living through time, looking ahead, seeing, yes, I know the future. I can see it. He is experiencing it differently than we are. He he sees the end because the end and the beginning to him are the same. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's he's everlasting to everlasting, the beginning and the end, before the beginning, before the end. Remember that his eyes are like those flames of fire. They are perfectly illuminated. And it's interesting too that the spirit is symbolized by flame, uh, just in general. I think that that's a very a very powerful symbol. And of course, we see Jesus's eyes as fire. He mediates between us and the Father. He's not physically here, but he is here with us through his spirit. So that is what we rely on now. And then this particular church, he's writing to those who are being persecuted, those who are being mocked and ridiculed by their, for their faith, people that are being, that you know, there's real violence going on against the, this church at this time. And he's giving this first little bit of the letter, he's giving encouragement to their hard work and to their faithfulness. And he's saying, look, I see you. What you are doing has not gone unnoticed because it can feel that way sometimes. And it can feel that way to us. It can seem as though we're doing the work, we're doing the things that we're supposed to be doing to the best of our abilities. And we're just losing. And, and it seems sometimes like God's not there and like he doesn't recognize what we're doing. But this is one of those reminders. Hey, no, I, I do see you. I'm here with you. My spirit is always with you. You're not alone in this. It may feel that way sometimes, but that's why the the endurance aspect, the persevering through these trials and tribulations is so important because we're not alone in this. We're, we're getting through it because of the, the power that he he passes on. And it may, it may seem like God has forgotten about us or that we're losing, but it's just not the case. 
also about this this little note on you have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not you have discovered they are liars this is super super relevant to our world today because there's a lot of people a lot of people in culture that are trying to change the bible they're 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 trying to reinterpret scripture to meet their ideas of how life should be they're trying to make it more inclusive they're trying to make it more palatable for culture they're trying to conform so, so like I, I want people to come into church i don't want them to feel judged and shamed so let's not talk about that part let's not talk about the condemnation let's let's just preach the love and the forgiveness and everything and leave the rest of it out obviously the love the forgiveness the grace the mercy those are super important they have to be taught but when you when you try to fit it in with like what society says, you know, love is love and there's all these different pathways to God. You don't have to go through Jesus. It's just an option. It's a good option, but it's not the only one. Like this is this is just not true. And he's in he's pointing out that there are certain people that say they're apostles, that say they're preaching the message of God, that say that they're following Jesus. And they're, they're just not. They're liars. They're lying to themselves. They're lying to others. And he has said, you've rooted them out. You've discovered that they're liars. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, later, but that's a very important thing for us to notice in this day and age because there's just so much of that going on. And one of the ways, I can't remember the verse off the top of my head, I should have should have wrote it down, but he talks about how, like, how do you know if somebody is a false prophet? How do you know if somebody does not have the spirit? And I believe it's Paul that's writing, he talks about how, well, you have to test them. You have to ask them questions. And one of the ways that you can you can find this out is, how do they respond to the name of Jesus? Will they proclaim the name of Jesus? And when I first read that, I thought that's kind of silly. Like you can just lie and say that. But but then I, I recently in the last couple months, especially, but in the last few years in general, you see these people that are saying that, well, this is the message behind what Christ is teaching. And they take bits and pieces of it out. And then they act as if they're teaching the message. They act as if they're 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 a member of the church. And that they're preaching the gospel but then you ask them to say well who 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 should we follow and they are reluctant to say the name jesus they're reluctant to say that we're following christ or they'll they'll find these other these other words to use that are referring to jesus but they won't say that name i think that that's super interesting verse four but i have this complaint against you you don't love each other or me as you did at first and so that's again, relevant. It's easy to get caught up in the world and to, to get fixated on other stuff and to gradually take our eyes off of God, even while we're trying to serve him, right? We get fixated on the things that we do and what we bring to the table, and we get fixated on the practices and the, the things, the stuff, when love is actually the fulfillment of the law. Love is what we should be focusing on. It doesn't mean that we get to do away with the works. It doesn't mean that we don't have to serve, that we don't have to preach, that we don't have to disciple people that we don't have to tithe that we don't have to do all these other things we do have to do those things but it's the it, without love is meaningless right and so he's saying look you you are doing certain things right and i see you but you have to love each other you have to love me you have to do this from the right place you have to do this from a place of love because if you are acting without love then you're not really acting from god because because God fills us with that love. God fills us with that spirit. And sometimes we don't feel it, right? And it's not a condemnation if you just don't feel super loving towards somebody. He's not saying that, but it's something that we can't overlook. And also, too, I like this because he's not just saying, you know what? You didn't love each other. That's it. He's giving them that rebuke, that rec that correction to bring them back on track. And so it's easy for us as individuals and as organizations, as churches, as whatever else, as groups, to get fixated on the things and to, to go astray a little bit. And we're going to see that in just a second. But this is not a, hey, you drop the ball, you're done. There is always that correction. Hey, I'm giving you another chance. I'm telling you, you you're messing up. <laughs> and he's going to tell us those things to bring us back on track. But that doesn't mean that just because we have gotten off track, that, that that's it. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. So this, again, is a warning that, look, like you're not totally secure. If you choose to turn away, if you 
over time, if you, you know, if you mess up, that's one thing. But if you just refuse to repent, if you're not trying, if you're not giving some effort there, your lampstand will be taken. So the spirit that is animating the church or you as an individual can be removed. And that's something that we need to be very aware of and, and, and to be concerned about, because, again, I, you know, we, we go through phases in life where maybe we turn away from God, maybe on purpose, maybe not. And I think that God is very forgiving. He's very he's very gracious in that. and He's very patient with us. But at some point we do have to repent. It is what it is. So this is not a feel good message about being nice. It's about it's, it's not love in the sense that, like, you have to be warm and, and cozy towards each other. It's love as a living sacrifice. It's love as an action. Love as a the things that you do. It's a it's a verb. It's not just a feeling. It's not a passive state of, oh, I just sit here loving you. It's love that I'm going to go work and do things that are uncomfortable for me to serve God, to serve other people. I'm going to to step out of my comfort zone. I'm going to put myself last. I'm going to take care of other people. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. Whoever has obey, or excuse me, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. John 14, 21. So how do we know if we have that love? It's because if is if we consistently do what Jesus called us to do. Again, we're not perfect. We're going to mess it up a lot. But if we're generally moving in the right direction, then that is a good indicator that we're on the right track. Now, the Bible also says that love is patient, love is kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it does not dishonor, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Again, it's not happy go lucky. These are difficult things to do. These are actions, these are lifestyles. We are to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, and he demonstrated that through his sacrifice. He demonstrated his love through the way that he lived. So don't get, get stuck thinking that if you just feel good towards other people, if you just, like in your heart, try to forgive them and feel, feel warmly towards them that you're doing enough. No, it is, it is the way that you interact with the world. All right. And the lampstand being removed also may symbolize the spirit leaving that church or that person. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So without the fear of God, there can be no wisdom because that, that flame is gone. So it, there's no illumination. It's just darkness. And when you see people that have turned away from God, people or churches even, and you start saying, well, how does, how does, how does the church end up conforming to the world? How does the church end up taking on pagan practices? And that seems kind of strange to some people. Well, we don't really do paganism anymore. Well, yeah, actually, no, we do. And you look at some of the, the, the decisions that organizations and churches in general have made in recent times, they say, well, how can they do that? Because they don't fear God. And without, without that fear of God, there's no wisdom. Verse six, but this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the, of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Um, it, I, I couldn't find much agreement on who the Nicolaitans are. I might not even be saying it right. But he's saying, look, like, yes, this is a very stern warning. This is a real danger. And I'm not saying like, you know, just keep loving each other and you're good. You have to do the thing. You have to do the work. Right. But this is in your favor because, again, um, you hate the evil deeds just as I do. So you're on the right track. You just you just you just got off base a little bit. Verse seven, anyone, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. So if, if we remain faithful, despite trials, despite persecution, the reward for that is eternal life and return to paradise. All right, next phase. This is going to be the church, church in Smyrna, the letter to the church in Smyrna. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Smyrna. This is the message from the one who was first and the last who was dead but is now alive. So in each of these different letters, he uses that last episode, we talked about the way that Jesus appeared to John and the vision. And so different elements of that appearance are going to show up in these different letters to the churches. And there is a correspondence to which particular aspect of that, that, um, that vision appeared. Um, are being put into the church. They're, they, 
it relates to the message that is being being um, being given. I know about your suffering and about your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. So again, I know your works. God sees everything, good and bad. Nothing's hidden from him. He's aware of what's happening. He's aware of what's in our hearts. He's aware of why we do what we do, as well as what we actually do. So this first part, I know about your, your suffering. I know about your poverty. Albert Barnes writes, poverty is no hindrance to the favor of God. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. It doesn't matter what you have to work with in the material realm. Those are not obstacles to God. If you are rich, if you are poor, if you are somewhere in the middle, if you are comfortable, if you are stressed, whatever it is, those things don't play into spirituality. They don't play into the grace of God. Okay. Now, certainly they can distract from God, but that's not because of something to do with the wealth itself. That's to do with our perception of it. That's the way that's, that has to do with the way that we relate to physical things. Romans 5, 3 through 9 says, and not only this, but we will also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance brings about proven character and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So there is definitely something to be said about when we get things, we need to praise God, right? And that is, that is, that is a cause for celebration. It's a cause for joy. But at the same time, we need to be good at praising God even when we're still in the storm, even when we are not really where we want to be. We still need to learn to praise God. And that was actually, it's, it's funny that this comes up. I wasn't thinking about it, but this was a huge part of my prayer this morning because there's there's a particular thing that I'm just really, really grappling with right now. And it's it's been a longstanding issue and it's it's seriously weighing on me. And I've been praying about it. I've been reading scripture related to it. I've been doing what I can to stay on top of things. And I keep having to go back and say, you know what, God, like, you know what I need, you know what I want. But at the same time, I need to remember that you're still good, even if I don't get this, even if I am not where I want to be and I don't have this thing that I want so desperately. It, it's that's that doesn't detract from God's glory, that that doesn't detract from the grace that has been poured out upon me, that doesn't detract from how praiseworthy God is. It's super important to do that when we when we say I have to have this thing given to me in order to praise God. I, I don't think I need to say anything more about that. The way that that just sounds is so, so wrong. And yet when we're in the heat of the moment, when we're in the darkness, when we're fixated on our suffering, we forget that. And we don't necessarily consciously say, well, I'll, I'll praise God when this gets good. No, this is something that we need to rejoice in now because his ways are higher than ours his thoughts are higher than ours just as heaven is higher than earth we don't necessarily understand why things are the way that they are but we can trust that he has a reason for it and if we ask him for the wisdom to understand this and the perseverance to walk faithfully according to his will he's not going to deny that to us that is something that he will give to us the bible says that if we ask for wisdom we will get it it doesn't say that about a lot of stuff but it does say if we ask for wisdom, we're going to get it. So perseverance develops character. Character develops hope. Because when you when you know that you have been through difficult times and that that has built you up as a person, you can start and that God has gotten you through those difficult times and that you have tested your faith, you have applied it. It has been a real thing for you. That gives you hope because that is it's like if you go to the gym. You get stronger and stronger and stronger. And at some point you start to trust yourself because you know, well, you know, I've been disciplined in, in working out consistently without fail for two, three years. You know what? You start to trust yourself with other things too. I've been disciplined with my with my fitness, with my money, and with 
how hard I work, right? Like I don't spend money on frivolous things. I don't, I'm not lazy at work. I work really diff, I work hard at a difficult job, whatever it is. And so when you decide, I want to go make this big decision, I want to take this risk and go out on a limb here. I'm scared, but I trust myself because I have years of dedication to show that I will show up. I will be consistent and I will, I will push through this. So I have that character and that gives you hope. And of course, this hope is in, is in God. It's in learning to persevere in faith and to put your trust in him. And you can't do that when things are easy. You can a little bit, but it, it really, it, it's different when you're going through difficult times. You learn to rely on him and then he gets you through it. So that builds your faith, it builds your hope, um, which of course is, is manifested through the Holy Spirit, which is in our hearts. And on top of poverty and, and tribulation, both us and the early church had to endure the blaspheming of God's name. And that's actually a really difficult thing to do. That's one of the things that this church is, is dealing with. And they're about to be persecuted. He's saying, you're about to go through it. So just trust me. Um, but yeah, the blasphemy, it's, it's difficult, right? We want to jump up and defend it. God has done so much for us. We hate when other people mock him. It just doesn't feel right. So remember that this is nothing new. We're dealing with it today. And sometimes it can be difficult to understand. How can people be so hateful towards God? This is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. This has been going on for a very long time. Now, on the verse that says, but they are the synagogues of Satan, John Gill writes that they're the children of the devil. They've imitated him. They're influenced by him. And they were the for, they're the forerunners of the Antichrist, whose coming was after the working of Satan. And I would add that this, this pattern of the, the synagogues of Satan, this, this pattern is still playing out. You know, people back to the whole false apostles thing, people will say that they are making these groups in service of God, that they're doing things, you know, by the spirit and they're just lying. And it's, it's not true by their fruits. You will know them. If you pay attention and, and with wisdom and discernment, you can you can see who is who is authentic and who is not. But this has been going on for a long time. And in fact, not everybody that professes the name is, in fact, following God. So you 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 have to. You have to learn to test the things that are that are spoken to you. You have to learn to test the things that you see. You'll you'll run into all kinds of stuff in culture, in your actual life, online, in media, wherever else. And people will try to tell you certain things. You have to test and you have to learn to look at it uh, based off of the fruits. All right. So next up, message to the church in Pergamum. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with a two-edged sharp sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Again, there's that, I know that you're going through this. I understand. Yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some of those among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone who has, he who has ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. All right, a couple things with that. So when Jesus was on earth, he already told us to expect trials, to expect tribulation to expect difficulties. I want to point out too, as long as we're talking about Satan, one of the the words used to describe Satan, and I believe I, I think that has something to do with one of the, the translations. Um, but it, it, if nothing else, it's just used a lot just as a adjective. Satan as the accuser. What does that mean? Well, remember in the Garden of Eden when they ate of the fruit and they felt self-conscious and they hid from God out of shame, right? God didn't tell them, I can't look at you. But they hid from him. They didn't know they know they felt self-conscious. They were looking at their own iniquity. And because of that, they had to leave the garden. 
because they could no longer just be with God. They had taken their eyes off of him. They were focused too much on themselves. That's what accusation does to you. It makes you self-conscious. The shame, the guilt, it creates separation. The, accu the accusation makes us feel separated from God, when in reality, God is always with us and in us. The devil's plan is for the trials to separate us from God, right? And if he can accuse us of our sins, if he can point out, look, you did this wrong, you're not worthy because of X, Y, Z, then that, that may be true. But when we focus on that, instead of focusing on the love, the mercy, the forgiveness that Jesus has for us, the fact that he has already taken the burden of those sins away from us, if we'll just accept it, that's what we need to be focusing on. And so these trials, they're, they're meant to take us away from God. They're meant to shake our faith and to, to, to make us fixate on the, the worldly stuff. But if we learn to lean on the Lord, it will have the opposite effect because his power is made perfect in our weakness. And when we, we learn to trust best, when we have nothing else to lean on but faith, when we have nothing but God to lean on and we choose to turn to him and he saves us, that, that really teaches us a, a, a different lesson there. Now, as far as the, the 10 days go, that can mean a couple of different things. And again, this is one of the things that people argue about. It could mean a literal 10 days. I really doubt it, just given the context of the book and the just the nature of these visionary experiences. Everything is done through metaphors, done through sim symbolism. 10 is certainly a, it's a, it's a type of completeness. It's a type of unity. Um, it also can just, the, the days specifically, I don't think necessarily mean a 24 hour period, 10 periods, 10 cycles, um, stuff like that. And, and one of the things that, I, that that came up when I was doing some research for this was that 10, 10 generations, you know, can kind of just mean indefinitely. This is something that's going to happen for a very long time. I think that the 10 days could mean something similar, not in the same sense of like, this is forever, this is generational, but in the sense that you know, a ten, 10 generations is indefinite, 10 days is indefinite to the person, right? Like in the, in the context of one human lifespan, this, this could be an unforeseeably long amount of time, and you're not going to know the exact link, and that's okay. Matthew 10, 28 says, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. So remember that the purpose of these trials is to prove and strengthen our faith, and to bring us closer to God. In the Old Testament, whenever Israel prospered, they turned away from God. They would trust in the Lord, they would do well, and then maybe that generation was fine, but the next generation grew up and things were easy for them. And so they would start to gradually, sometimes not so gradually, turn back to idolatry, turn to the pursuit of pleasure. They get involved in all kinds of weird sexual stuff. They get involved in all sorts of, you know, these crazy feasts and, um, they would, they would start to treat each other dishonestly in, in business and in the way that they just interacted with one another. They would turn away from God, and then that's when the prophets would come in and say, hey, you guys are putting up idols in the temple. You, you're not following the Lord anymore. Destruction is coming. And people nowadays, anyway, look at that and say, oh, God's so wrathful and vengeful. He's so, he's so aggressive and, and harsh. There's so much severity there. Well, that's the discipline that brings us back. Because every time he smoked them, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but every time he, he, would, he would pour out wrath upon them, they would be scattered, they would be hurt, they would be, um, they would be put into a place where they were afraid, and they were being persecuted, and then they would turn back to God, right? And so that's kind of the, the cycle that, that's, be, that's being demonstrated here. Um, when you turn because because they would they would turn back to God and then things would go well for them again. And then again, maybe their generation, maybe the next, maybe, maybe several generations down the road, they would start to gradually shift back towards wickedness again. And so this is the call to say, hey, look, like, don't do that. <laughs> Understand that you have to follow God when it's hard, but and also when it's good. But when the trials come, they're not just because it's like, I'm just harsh. I'm just going to be mean to you and whatever. So these are actually good things for us. They test our character. They build our faith because we learn to trust in God when we don't have anything else to turn to. He's called us to overcome. He's called us to conquer, to persevere. These trials are the battlegrounds where we are tested. You grow through adversity. 
and through pain. And pain also helps you turn away from the world and towards divinity. Because when things are good and you're just involved in pleasure, you have all the foods you want, things are comfortable, things are easy. It's easy to get stuck on that. You know, we look back to the garden. Why was there the curse of pain? And um, St. Maximus the Confessor points out that actually wasn't the curse. That was the, the, the salvation in a sense, not, not the total sense, obviously, that, that might be the wrong word, but it was, it was a good thing because if it, there was just pleasure, no pain, we would be so fixated on the world, we would never turn our eyes towards God. There would be no reason to. And of course we die and life is over, right? So without death, without some kind of boundaries there, without some kind of structure of discipline, then we're not, we're, we're not, we're, we're wired to stay fixated on that. It's, to stay tuned into it. So the double-edged short sword, excuse me, um, is representing the twofold nature of the word of God. It's convicting and converting. It's wounding and it's healing. It's cutting through the lies of the wicked, but it's also cutting through the bitterness of the self-righteous. It's it cuts every which way. It's not limited, it's not unidirectional. If you're wrong, you're wrong. All right. And those who hold fast to the faith even in the belly of the beast, even around Satan's throne, which is, of course, the world. Remember that um, he's been given power over the earth. This is not only direction to endure, but also consolation that even in the heart of darkness, even around the throne of Satan, God still sees you. He has not turned away. Where you dwell, he understands the temptation that we're surrounded by. He knows that we're not in an easy place. Jesus went up against the same things and he overcame. Hold fast to my name. Talk about, um, let's talk about, you know, like the, the, the name, the name of Jesus, the false teachers, like we said a minute ago, let's talk about that again. When we hold on to that name, that is what gives us strength. That is what gives us power. When we say, well, I'm just going to trust in the, the message of God and the, then in, in the, the wisdom, the things that make sense in the Bible, but I'm not going to hold on to who Jesus is. That's when we go astray. And that's the, the, the place a lot of people, unfortunately, seem to be in, right? First John 4, 1 through 3 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses the name of Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from God. Or excuse me, uh, every, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So I did put this verse in here. Good. Um, that's what I was trying to think of a minute ago. So he's saying, look, if the spirit, if the person, if the church won't confess that Jesus is the son of God, fully God, also fully human, it's not from him. It's not from God. And so when people are trying to tell you, well, God, no, 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 God is this. God is love. And that's it. Well, that's, that's not really true. And you can test that again by, well, how do they feel about the name of Jesus? How do they feel about the name of Christ? Matthew 7, 15 to 20 says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So. Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not appear, that does not bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Enough said. All right. Where are we at? Um, okay, the new manna, the spiritual bread, right? Manna was what rained down and sustained the Israelites in the deserts, cried out for food. We don't have any food. What we do, God will provide. That's why, and again, like we talked about on the devotional recently, you know, God sees your potential. He sees what you could be. He calls you to do something and your current situation is no obstacle for him, right? If you say, well, I don't have this, that, or the other. I don't have the resources. I don't have the connections, the finances, the know-how, the technical skills, the articulation, whatever. It doesn't matter. God could give you that. When they were wandering in the desert, I said, well, how, we can't do this. We don't have food. Boom. Roof. Food from the sky. <laughs> Here's some food. You're good now. Keep following me. Keep trusting me. But Moses said, you know, God, like, that's a great plan to lead them out of Israel, but you got the wrong guy. I can't speak well. Okay. I'll give you your cousin. He'll help you. 
okay, but they won't believe me. I don't have any power, blah, blah, blah. Um, you don't have anything. What's in your hand there? Got a little walking stick? Yeah, throw that on the ground. Boom, snake. Ah, but what if they still, they're still not going to believe me. Like, their magicians do that too. Okay, boom. Um, let's turn the whole river to blood. Let's, let's make the sun disappear. Let's, <laughs> like, those things, it's not an obstacle to God. He wants us to follow him, to be obedient, and he will sustain us through that. The spiritual bread, the new manna that we are being given is of a spiritual food. It's something that sustains us through trials, through persecution, through adversity, through the, just the rigors of life in general. Now, the white stone is super interesting. So again, this, is, this is one of the things that people argue about. So I'm not going to say I have a definitive answer on it. But one of the things that came up that was super interesting, there's, there's this old custom of dropping, like if you're, if you're accused of a crime, you drop stones into like an urn, like some sort of container. You drop black stone and a white stone. And the person that's being accused will reach in and pull one out. And if he pulls out the white pebble, then that means he's innocent and he's acquitted. The black one means that he's guilty. And so to be given the white stone kind of shows is a way, could be a way of showing your innocence, showing that you have been acquitted. You have been you're not going to be charged with guilt for the for the sins that you have actually committed, right? Now, again, people don't agree on this. This isn't like a for sure thing. Um, I did think it was super interesting, though. Whatever it means, it's obviously symbolic of some sort of token by which the believer can be assured of his or her identity in Christ. It's engraved, and it doesn't only demonstrate the worth of the receiver that they have been given it, but also his or her connection to the one who gave it. So it's this relationship, it's this, this tangible, semi-tangible thing that you have, and there's a secret name on it that is known only to you. It shows how the rest of the world is not going to recognize this thing that you have been given, this faith, this hope, this promise, this identity in Christ, because you have been given a new identity, right? When you are saved, you are made new. You are washed clean. You have been, you have been acquitted of your sins. You are given a new identity, and this is a way of representing that, and it does not make sense to the world, right? They never understand how someone with the conviction of the Holy Spirit can hold so firmly to that belief because it's a secret. It's between you and God. Colossians 3, 3 says, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. What sustains us is not of this world. It's of the Spirit. So God often changes names in the Bible right, when they've received their call, and we are called to be a new creation. All right, a message to the church in Thyatira, Thyatira, I don't know. I'm probably going to butcher a lot of names. Just, just roll with it. I'm sorry. Write this letter to the angel of the church in that place. Um, <laughs> this is the message from the Son of God, whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. So a lot of people believe that the feet like brass thing kind of indicates strength and stability. And hold on, let me grab some coffee. But I, this is actually one of my favorite parts of the episode. I think this is this was like I was I was kind of confused when I first read it. I, I've always been confused when I read Revelation, but I've been thinking about it more and doing some research and What's interesting is that brass was used in the construction of the altar, okay? And I think that that symbolizes something very profound because feet are the foundation that hold up the rest of the body. Therefore, comparing the feet to the altar demonstrates that sacrifice is at the foundation of our walk with God. So sacrificing our animal nature, sacrificing the things of this world, the things that we think we are, the things that lead us into sin, upon the altar to uphold our spiritual walk. Everything is sacrificed. Everything. It's fundamental to life. We can't get anything without sacrifice. We can't have a good life for ourselves without giving up some things that would take us away from that, right? Like I may want to go smoke weed and drink and goof off and watch TV, but if I want to be successful, I can't do those things, at least not all the time, but I, I certainly can't just go do those things whenever I want to. I have to sacrifice my desire to do that stuff in order to be successful. 
I may want to, if I want to have a good marriage, I want to have a good relationship, a strong family, I have to sacrifice certain things. I have to sacrifice my time, my resources. I have to sacrifice the pursuit of other people. I have to sacrifice the pursuit of things that would take me away from my family, right? If I want to live a strong life of faith, I have to sacrifice everything, right? It doesn't mean that I have to give it up and never have anything. It means that I have to be willing to sacrifice it, right? So if it comes down to money, if it comes down to time, if it comes down to, to status, to pride, to prestige, whatever, I have to give that stuff up. It doesn't mean that I can't have those things, right? Because God may give them back to me. He may recognize like, hey, no, 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 I actually do want you to have this, but you have to give it up to him first, right? If you hold on to it and say like, I would give this to you if you ask, right? On the other hand, you have Abraham. God said, hey, sacrifice your, your son, your only son for me. And Abraham had so much faith that God would actually return his son to him because he's, he said, God promised me generations. He promised me that I would be the father of nations. If he's telling me to give up my son, that can't be the end of the story, right? And he had so much faith that God would restore his son. I, he seemed to think that God would actually allow him to sacrifice him, but would bring him back. But because of that, God said, no, 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 you're good. That's, that's all I wanted. I wanted you to be able to give this up. I don't necessarily want it from you. I may want you to have this thing, but I don't want that relationship to the thing that you have to be more important than your relationship to me, right? And so I think that comparing the, um, comparing that, the, the feet of, of, of um, the, the feet to the altar, I think is super important. And it also does symbolize, you know, strength and stability. Like I said, it's something that he, he talks in a second about treading upon the, the clay pots or whatever. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. It does, it, it does symbolize like, hey, this is a, this is a, a, a powerful thing, right? If my feet are of bronze and they're crushing my opponents, that's, that's also a, an interesting image. And to the whole, I mentioned this, I think in Ezekiel, the image of like burning metal when it's just super heated and it's got flames coming out of it. And there's just that, there's just that light radiating, radiating out from the middle of it. That's a really powerful thing too, you know, and it gives a certain amount. It's like, it's still the, the flames of the spirit, but it gives it a certain form that we can kind of understand. I think that that's interesting. It also treads upon and burns away all impurities, right? Superheated metal, you know, just, obliterating anything that's impure, anything that is not of us, or excuse me, not of God. All right. Whose eyes are like flames of fire, whose feet are like polished bronze. I know all the things you do. There it is again. I have seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance, and I can see your constant improvement in all of these things. So again, you don't have to be perfect. It's that constant improvement. I'm I'm making the effort. I'm getting better. Yes, I I I I relapsed. Yes, I I kind of slid back a little bit. Yes, I fell back into old habits. What is it? Is it falling off the horse or is it getting or the wagon? One of those, something like that. It's like, yeah, you're you're not perfect, but I see that you're getting better. And God is recognizing that. And that's by the way, these are messages to the church, these specific churches, but it's to the church in general. It's written to this particular group of believers, but it's written for all believers. So God sees what you do. He understands your faith. He sees what you're you're going through. He sees what you're enduring. And he understands it too, because Jesus went through the same things. He goes on to say in verse 20, but I have this complaint against you. You are per permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching. Deeper truths, as they call them, depths of Satan, actually. We're going we're gonna to get back to that in a second. I will ask nothing more of you except that you will hold tightly to what you have until I come. 
to all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end. To them, I give authority over all the nations. I will give authority over, uh, over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I have received from my father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. So we're going to circle back around, but that last little bit, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit. So first of all, you have to listen, right? Like it's not just like you have the information, you have to pay attention, you have to receive, you have to, when God corrects you, you have to respond, right? Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. You have to think about this stuff. You have to contemplate on it. You have to meditate on it. You have to absorb it and make it a part of you. Okay, so let's let's back up a little bit. So the spirit of Jezebel is something that we're going to have to. That's something that we're going to do in another episode. There's going to be just an episode on the spirit of Jezebel. I don't know when, but that's complicated. For now, though, just understand this generally. She she represents something specific. She she seduces people towards an over like sexuality, but also towards an over obsession with spirituality. But it's a spirituality that is devoid of holiness. Okay, so think New Age philosophy. Think, you know, Buddhism. Think these um, the 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 chakras and astrology and everything. It's like it's not necessarily that there isn't anything good in there that you couldn't take out. You know, if you just remove a, a, probably most of it, um, it doesn't mean that there's not anything in there. But like, what is that stuff? It's people keep saying that they're spiritual. They say that no, 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 I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. What does that mean? It means that you're devoid of holiness. It means that you don't actually follow God. You just understand that there is a spiritual component to life and you try to lean into that, right? Now, as Christians, we should lean into the spiritual part of our lives, but that is subservient to God's will. That is under the call to be righteous and upright in his sight. So the spirit of Jezebel seduces people towards that spirituality. That is, it's, it's spirituality for the sake of spirituality. There's no deeper truth there. It's it's a it's an obsession with oneself. It's an obsession with um, it's a it's a worship of oneself. It's a self idolization because if you worship your spirit, if you put all of your attention on your spirit and like yeah, like I have these you know this mystical connection with the rest of the universe, you're worshiping nature because you're fixated on that being the source of your power, that being the source of life, that being where you draw strength from, that being where you put all of your attention instead of on God. And this is spirituality from the devil. It's not from God. The devil does not care if you are spiritual or not. He doesn't care if you're pursuing, you know, this, this mystical path. As long as you're not following God, he doesn't care what you do. He'll encourage it. He'll throw the fuel on the fire. She's also an obsession with sexuality and promiscuity. Now, obviously, this is pretty prevalent in today's society, but this is not anything new. So um, promiscuity was something that was very common in pagan celebrations. It still is, I guess. Um, so the part about like they've eaten food sacrificed to idols, that means a few things. One is that if you're at these festivals, which is where the food is sacrificed to idols, you're probably engaging in these orgies and debaucherous celebrations and entertainment. And it's, it's not, it's not like people are just out having a few drinks. Like it was pretty wide open stuff. It was pretty, it was pretty intense. And so if you're engaged in eating the food given to idols, like you're you're involved in some stuff you really should not be as believers and in general, but especially as as children of God. And also too, to think of, we'll do this on another episode, too, but just like to kind of wave tops here. So we have we have time for everything. Um, when you eat something, you're making it a part of yourself. Right. So when, when we take communion, when we say this is the body of Christ and we eat it. This is the blood of Christ, and we eat, we drink it. We're symbolically taking Jesus and making him a part of ourselves, right? And, you know, Orthodox and, and Catholic viewpoints take that a lot more seriously than Protestants do. Not going to get into that today. Just understand, like, that is part, at least a, a huge part of the symbolism that we are, we are integrating the body and the blood of Jesus his nature into ourselves, right? So when you turn that around and say, well, I'm going to take the food that was sacrificed to the goddess of lust or the god of anger and war or whatever else and all these, these pagan deities, 
I'm going to take what was dedicated to something that is not holy, something that is not God, and I'm going to just casually eat that. I think, I think it's important to understand that like, there is a real thing that's taking place there. I know a lot of Christians don't believe that there are that, that, that those deities exist. I, I would argue that there there certainly is. I don't again another episode because it's not totally relevant to Revelations, but there is, if nothing else, a very real demonic presence there, right? It's not just that this food is here and it's given to an idol and then it's whatever, right? Like there, there's a satanic involvement and influence working there. So if you take that, even in, and you integrate that into yourself, you may not consciously think of it that way, but unconsciously you do. Spiritually, you definitely do. You understand that you're partaking in something. You're breaking bread with debauchery, you know, degenerate people. That does something to you, and it, it opens a door that should not be open. And of course, the spirit of Jezebel is very persuasive and very enticing in her presentation. She calls herself a prophet. She tries to, you know, think teal swan kind of thing. You know, this is something that that draws people in, and it seems harmless and unassuming. It seems good, even. It seems it seems enticing, but it is actually quite dangerous. Okay, um, down in, I will give to each of you whatever is deserved. Um, I will I will throw her on a bed of suffering. I think that's kind of poetic there. Um, those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly unless they repent and turn away from their evil deeds. Um, I also have a message for the rest of you who have not followed this teaching, this false teaching, the, the in quotation marks, deeper truths, as they call them. They're the depths of Satan, actually. And I'm, I'm reading from the New Living Translation here. So. This opens up a huge door, um, and we will certainly talk about it a little bit. We're going to go more in depth in, in later episodes because I don't want to get too fixated on other stuff. But these deeper truths, that's like a very, that's something that you hear people talk about a lot. Like, I have an understanding of the Bible that other people don't. I, I, I have the deeper insight into scripture that, you know, Christians are getting it wrong. I see the deeper truths. And so you see this very, like, Gnostic approach of, like, it's all about your personal revelation. It, is, it doesn't have much to do with what the words say. And somehow these personal revelations from people that, that teach this stuff always seems to disagree with everything in Scripture. It always seems to, to, to be opposed to Christianity. It's not an enhancement. It's not a like, hey, I had this profound mystical experience. Now I, I understand love better and I'm able to do it. And I love Jesus more and I'm treating people better and I'm working harder for the faith. It's always... Oh, I understood that this this rule doesn't apply and I'm not going to do it because I have this insight, whatever. These are deeper truths. These are from the depths of hell. These are from as this is exactly what it's saying. This is from Satan. He doesn't care if you're spiritual. He cares if you're following God. And of course, God says, if you're not doing this stuff, just 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 hold on. <laughs> just keep doing it. You will be given authority over the world in the end. Um, in verse where was it? Twenty eight. Um, they will have the same authority I received from my father, and I will also give them the morning star. So what is the morning star? It is the sign that day is approaching. It's the end of the night. Dawn is on its way. The dawn of salvation, the dawn of eternal life, you know, after darkness and bondage to sin. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying. So. That is going to wrap it up for us today, folks. Thank you so much for your time. If you enjoyed this, make sure that you like, you subscribe, share with your friends, send it to people, and I will see you next time.